Welcome to the Urology Coding and Reimbursement Podcast, where we help urologists and staff achieve peak economic and practice efficiency so there is time and energy to focus on patient care and a happy life. I'm your host, Scott Painter, with my co-hosts, Mark Painter and Dr. Ray Painter. Welcome to episode 58 of the Urology Coding and Reimbursement Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Painter, with my co-host, Mark Painter and Dr. Ray Painter. And on this episode, we'd like to welcome back Dr. John Lynn. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Dr. Lynn. We appreciate you uh, giving your input and bringing us some additional topics from the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. So welcome, uh, Dr. Lynn. Thank you so much for having me again. All right. Well, today we wanted to cover, we wanted to do uh, several things. First, we wanted to circle back uh, with our PCNL discussion. We had uh, additional question and clarification that we wanted to uh, provide. And then also we had uh, uh, with the PCNL, uh, I mentioned we had an diff- additional question uh, that we wanted to cover. So we wanted to go in a little more in detail on the PCNL and provide a little clarification. Uh, additionally, we have a couple other questions. We wanted to cover uh, the use of modifier 25 when giving Lupron injections. So we'll discuss that. And then finally, we will cover uh, billing for multiple bladder biopsies uh, uh, taken from different locations. So with that, um, Mark, I will throw it over to you to kind of bring us up to speed. I know we covered the PCNL in a previous podcast. So bring us up to speed why we're covering this again. Well, um, so one of the things that was pointed out to us by um, one of the physicians listening to the podcast, um, who's down in Texas, thank you very much for the questions, by the way. Um, He had pointed out that there was an article published in by the AUA um, back in uh, December uh, specifically December 4th of 2018 in the advocacy, the AUA, um, uh, let's see, you get it directly, the AUA policy and advocacy brief um, that talked about PCNL coding. And um, when we talked to you last week about it, um, you know, our, our interpretation um, had been that percutaneous really meant that access um, percutaneously was included. Well, the AUA came out with a slightly different interpretation when they were first talking about the introduction of the new codes, the 50436 and the 50437. Um, What the AUA said in their their advocacy brief was that initial access provided by the urologist um, was separately billable under code 50432. now, I had said in, in our previous podcast that 50432 could definitely be billed with 50080 and 50081, but uh, my understanding was that you really should bill it only if you left a nephrostomy tube after the procedure or when, you, when the procedure was completed. Um, but the AUA's interpretation um, in this article is that the 50432 um, would be appropriate to establish access um, to do the PCNL Um, if you were doing it on your own um, without the assistance of interventional radiology. Interventional radiology still uh, would charge 50436 or 50437, the the, the codes that were introduced in 2019. Um, And then you would be, you would still, it'd still be appropriate for you to build the PCNL full if you didn't establish the access. And that's probably where the AUA um, came up with their guidance. Um, So uh, at this point in time, I will say I stand corrected um, on this. Um, I can certainly understand where the AUA is coming from in the way that they looked at this being done, at at least at the time, with a a lot of the access established by interventional radiology um, and now as more and more urologists are establishing their own access, you know, the, the RVUs were based on the average work um, that was provided. So, um, so 
uh, the 50432, although we did tell you it could be billed, let's flip it around and um, and, and say uh, we'll stick with the AUA's interpretation that if you are providing access, you can go ahead and use the 50432. You can't bill it twice if you leave a tube afterwards, but um, it, again, 50432 and the 50080 or 81, depending on the stone size. Um, if you are establishing your own access, um, and then I say conversely, if you are leaving a tube afterwards, you should be able to use it even if somebody else establishes the access. So there is there are a couple of different cases where that 50432 would be appropriate. Now, the one thing the AUA did add um, is that if you are doing it tubeless, um, that you should, uh, you're not leaving the tube at the end of the case, that you, you should um, put a 52 modifier on the 50432. Um, so, um, I, again, the logic behind the AUA's article is um, sound in what they're trying to do and probably in based on the clinical vignettes um, relative to somebody else doing the interventional radiology. So uh, I apologize for misleading everyone. It's one of those things that the interpretation side of this um, from one side, maybe as you, you turn through, we all keep learning and I'm, I'm in that category as well. Excellent. Uh, thanks for clarifying that, Mark. And uh, <clears throat> we did have uh, an additional question come in on PCNL, so let, let's go ahead and cover that now. John, what what was that question? Okay, this was a question from a member of the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group, and she asked, actually, she directly messaged me and asked, and I posted this question. So after a PCNL, if the stent is removed during the global period of the PCNL, how would you code for that stent removal if it's done not by the original surgeon, but by an APP employed by the group? Okay. So, you know, obviously a piece of that, the, the answer has to be, how did you remove it um, in the overall process? Um, so we'll get to that secondly. Um, but, you know, basically um, when the, and, and this probably relates to how, when can you use modifier 58? And, and cause ultimately it says done by the same physician. Um, you've probably heard us say a number of times that in the end, the, uh, the way Medicare looks at a group is really as, even though you have individual NPIs under the group number, you're really the same group or the same individual in many ways. So that single surgeon, applies across the practice to all the providers. Now, um, there you probably, just, just so you know, with, with the taxonomy differential of an APP um, versus the, the urologist, um, you may actually see something that was billed. Let's say you just pulled the string and your APP billed it as a visit just a straight e &M visit, it might actually go through the edits based on a taxonomy NPI um, combination that would put that through. Um, but when you look at kind of what the intention of an APP is and how that individual is involved in the practice, um, if they were to look at the documentation and dig under their covers, um, they would they would typically take that back as included. So you need to really treat that APP as another uh, physician or another, not a physician, but another QHP in your practice, and it would fall under that same global bucket. Um, so even though technically you may be able to snake it through on all those, the intention is um, that you're directing that care. You're that supervisor of the of the APP, so if you're the surgeon, that APP really should be treated as part of the global. So if they were to do a cysto stent removal, a 58 would be appropriate on that. Um, and if it's pulled with a string, then it's included. So the bottom line is if the procedure is done by an APP, the stent removal is done by the APP and it's done with cystoscopy and stent removal, it's important to document, number one, in the original op report of the PCNL, the plan of attack regarding the stent, 
meaning you want to document that uh, you plan to remove the stent in the office via cystoscopy and, and stent removal um, and uh, in a week or two. So make sure that's documented in the original op report. And then subsequent to that, if it's removed by the APP, it is okay. And modifier 58 can be used if the stent removal is done by the APP. Correct. Yep. Very good. Good clarification too. Thanks, John. <laughs> and if it's removed via pulling a string without using the cystoscope, then you do not bill anything extra for that. That is correct. All right. Awesome. Excellent. Anything uh, more we want to cover on PCNL? Or, and Ray, do you have anything to add to that? Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, any any more PCNL comments, Mark, John? Beat that one to death, I think, from your previous podcast and this one. Yes. Let's hope. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll open it up. If we miss something, ask us another question, and we'll we'll try to get it again. So um, it's a, you know, it, as you go through all this stuff, it's it's like in the end, they they don't always change the questions, but they do change the answers. And so, you know, we're giving you what we know at the moment. And 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 again, thanks to uh, to the to the, my friend in Texas who gave me uh, that additional information. All right. Okay, let's move on to uh, the next topic we wanted to cover, and that's the use of modifier 25 when giving Lupron injection. Uh, John, yeah. do you want to? This, this is a perennial question at, at our meetings in coding and billing at the Urology Advanced Coding and Reimbursement Seminar twice a year. Invariably, it's always asked the, the use of modifier 25 when providing another service. And Lupron is one of those, or LHRH agonist for the management of prostate cancer. The patient, typically the patient uh, comes in and you already schedule the patient for an LHRH injection. And then uh, obviously our, our attendees are very astute and they are thinking, well, can I use a modifier 25 if this uh, type of injection is happening? And I think it's important for Mark to go over again what's included in the administration of an LHRH agonist or any other service and what is not and the concept of uh, distinct and separately identifiable. Okay. Yeah, it's, it is a, a constant discussion across the board. And, and, I, and I think it's, it's appropriate. And, and really, <clears throat> as you look at everything, um, you need to start at what the global definition is and then kind of work backwards, right? So um, making sure that the patient is okay um, to have the procedure done that day. So that pre-service workup and, and, and ultimately, even though the injection code itself doesn't have a zero, 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 um, it has an XXX global, it still has a package um, that is tied to that injection that you would normally do for every single injection. And that's the way the reimbursement is based or developed. Um, I'm not going to say it's necessarily adequate, but that's the way the reimbursement is, is based. Um, so um, making sure the patient's okay, that would include checking up on, did they have any reactions to the last time? How's their general progress going? Those types of things um, relative to the LHRH shot, making sure that you want to give the next shot. All those questions, all those um the, the, those issues that you address with a patient are part of it. Um, and as is telling them afterwards, no, ma no matter how many times you do it, you know, how you're going to feel afterwards and what the risks and what you want to watch for, all of that is packaged into the giving that injection. Because you would never just walk in and give somebody injection and walk away without talking to them and make sure and it's okay. That's just part of that package. So, um, if that's what you're doing in that day, um, then no, you shouldn't bill uh, an E&M service. Um, that definition of modifier 25 is the next thing we want to talk about, it, and that's that significant and separately identifiable evaluation and management service on the same day as a procedure or service. Um, so the question we always follow up with when we're asked, can I bill that, is, 
did you do something significant, significant and separately identifiable, which means outside of that package and medically necessary during that time that you spent with the patient overall? Um, clear examples of, yes, I could charge for an E&M, are you're talking to the patient about their erectile dysfunction in addition to their LHRH and prescribing them drugs or refilling their meds relative to that erectile dysfunction. Those are outside that. Um, you know, following up with, um, you know, looking at a new PSA because um, you're tracking the disease state. Um, you know, if you had any additional data um, that came in relative to that prostate cancer, um, even though it's the same diagnosis, that is above and beyond what you would normally provide relative to the, uh, the, to the LHRH injection. So it doesn't have to be a separate diagnosis, and that is very clear in the CPT definition and in the definitions within the Medicare Carrier's Manual that it can be the same diagnosis. But it still does need to be significant and separately identifiable. So you need to be providing that patient's service um, relative to their prostate cancer, if that's all that patient is being seen for that day, um, that is above and beyond. So you'd need a new PSA, maybe a progression of the disease. You know, there's a number of things that would say, yes, that's appropriate. Um, now, that medical necessity piece is the other side of this. Um, you know, we're going to assume everybody's doing everything that medical necessity that that you're what you're doing is medically necessary to the follow-up of the disease process but medicare's not they're going to assume the other that you're just trying to to generate some more dollars when you see your patients so you know if you're doing monthly injections for an lhrh you know is it appropriate for that patient based on their condition to be checking the psa and to be updating all that stuff every single visit um you know, you'd have to ask a room full of urologists, and I would be willing to bet that a room full of urologists are going to say, no, it's probably not for most patients. Now, you may have some patients that you're monitoring that closely, and, and that's part of the process, but you'd have to be able to justify that to a room full of your colleagues um, as to when that should be done. Now, every three months, um, that's a different, you know, now you've got a little bit more of a window. Maybe there's a little, uh, a bit more medical necessity to follow up with those areas. And you may have a few more patients that have a modifier 25 E&M service with a three month. But I would say what we see as a coding pattern, um, for many urologists is that E&M visit with, uh, an LHRH injection is, more likely at six or six months or every 12 months um, that really supports the medical necessity of additional follow-up relative to the disease um, outside of what's given in that LHRH. So, um, so hopefully that helps in all of this. So remember medical necessity. Um, and ultimately, yes, you'll have patients that have those E&M visits more frequently than others. Um, but your documentation really needs to support that need and that separate effort um, that you're providing, as well as the separate cognitive efforts that you're being made um, with that patient and, and managing their disease. I think a common area of uh, confusion is that uh, you check a typically you check a PSA before. Uh, the, the next Lupron injection, you schedule the PSA and then you schedule the next Lupron or LHRH injection. I think a lot of people are trying to uh, create a modifier 25 event by simply looking at the PSA. And as you said, the medical necessity is there to look at that PSA, uh, probably not every month, <laughs> but it's, you know, qualifying as a modifier 25 event, but once in a while and you assess whether or not that the uh, patient is doing okay, or if the disease is progressing, uh, possibly uh, that's that's the that's the hard part, right? If the PSA remains undetectable, and then you simply continue Lupron, I I find that 
I find it difficult to justify a modifier 25 event. If I'm, if I'm simply looking at PSA, PSA is less, is, is less than 0 0.1. And, uh, and uh, we just simply proceed with the LHR injection. I think, I think just simply looking at that PSA, uh, it's hard for me to justify a modifier 25 event with that. Does that fall in the category of less significant but separately identifiable? So it doesn't yeah. meet both criteria? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 think, I, I think that's a good comment, Scott, that, yeah, significant is key. I mean – if you're just glancing through it, and I, I think that is a, a, a more difficult piece. Yes, you've got one piece of data, um, but you know, are you really making much of a medical decision-making process above, yep, I want to continue that injection. I want to give that patient that injection that day, which is, again, part of the injection itself. So, um, you know, that kind of falls in that area that, you know, if you're doing more than just the PSA when they're stable, then, yeah, maybe that one warrants a modifier 25. Um, but it is it, it is definitely a judgment call, and it is a documentation call that it really needs to be significant and separately identifiable. So, that, yeah, excellent point. As an aside, as an aside, I know in the – we're not talking about medical decision-making – Lupron or uh, testosterone and uh, some of the commonly administered drugs that we give, when it comes to medical decision making, a lot of people are trying to make the case that those drugs, because it does require monitoring, uh, fall into the category of high risk, RX therapy with monitoring. Uh, Mark, can you, uh, if you can just give us a bottom line, is there anything in urology typically in the, the typical outpatient urology office, that is going to be a high risk drug that we provide, other than probably some of the cancer, prostate cancer oncolytics. So, I, I would say the majority of urologists are not using drugs that fit into that category. Um, you, you have some prostate cancer specialization groups that are using those um, higher risk drugs. And there, there was a lot of discussion um, uh, within, um, from what we've heard, within the, the AMA when they, they talked about the differentiation of drug monitoring between a four and a five, a moderate and a high risk. And they were very clear that, you know, most drugs require some general monitoring. Uh, um, and that those didn't really fit in that high category and that the high risk category were really those drugs that you were monitoring the patient very frequently for organ, you know, variation, something that was, that would require immediate intervention. And, and basically you had to stay on top of it, you know, nearly weekly, um, with tests to make sure that they, they weren't hitting that toxicity level to change. Their, their drug regime. So um, LHRH, testosterone, those types of things were specifically not considered high risk, but put into the moderate risk categories. So um, yeah, it's, a, it, it, you know, it's there. It's true. You do have to monitor them. But um, the reality is that they, they had those discussions and they did expressly say that those types of monitoring would fall into the standard moderate risk category drug. So very few urologists were are actually using drugs that fall into the high risk category. Awesome. Thanks for the clarification. Scott, before we go to the next one, I want to circle back and talk about the injection code for just a minute. Mark mentioned it. But I think we should emphasize the fact that injection code is an XXX code, which means it is not a part of the global. And therefore, you should not need a, a modifier to charge an E&M. However, remember that uh, the payers set the rule. So Medicare has specifically bundled it, the E&M into it which means they're treating it just like a procedure. So everything Mark said about you know, the significant and separate and the 25 modifier applies. And I know that's confusing to those that 
are used to looking at rules, but don't always know how to cross track one rule with another. <laughs> yeah, that's yep. difficult for some people. Yep, the bundling edits, the NCCI are part of that. Yep. Yeah, and that trumps the designation of the code. All right. Well, I will. Uh, uh, one one little further point or for further bit of information that's a little bit of a side, but when uh, if you and and a reason why you should not use Google to code is you know one of the I was doing a search on Google and in, uh, injection codes, and I think the first one said uh, I mean I was googling Lupron and injection codes, and one of the first things that came up was. Don't use the injection code when you're uh, billing Lupron. So, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there on Google. So, again, if you're using Google to code, uh, you probably should steer away from that. Just a little aside. Okay. Final, mean, uh, final thing. Kind of, Scott, you mean kind of like when patients uh, use Dr. Google and <laughs> make their own diagnoses? <laughs> Yeah. I'm sure you have a ton of stories, John, uh, of, of Dr. Google coming into your, your practice. <laughs> All right. Uh, final thing we wanted to cover today. Oh, and, and I will add uh, one quick thing is modifier 25 and stones. If you look back at uh, all our episodes, I can tell you that those are the most listened to episodes that we have. So, so that's why we continue to bring that up and continue to talk about it. A lot of, a lot of confusion on those things. Yeah. Examples are great. Yes. Yep. And that's, that's, we get a lot of, a lot of requests for that. Okay. Final thing is we uh, wanted to talk about multiple bladder biopsies uh, taken from different locations. Again, uh, topics that we talk about. This is another very common question. So uh, John, you want to tell us what the question that, uh, that you got? Sure. Uh, this is another question from a member of the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group, another very learned member who's uh, constantly thinking about ways to uh, make sure they're not leaving money on the table. And that's one of the things that, that you get by attending seminars and, and uh, just listen, listening to podcasts is making sure that you are capturing everything that is just the due to you. And the question was, can you bill for multiple bladder biopsies if taken from three different locations? Uh, bladder biopsy code will be 52204, cystourethroscopy with biopsy. So consider 52204 if you perform that procedure multiple times during the same session, most likely in a facility. You take biopsies from multiple areas of the bladder. Can you code that multiple times? I like the way the guy thinks. <laughs> Mark, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we, we as we as we talk about all the different codes, the five two two zero four, the one four, the two four, the three. You know, all of those things have um, some subtle nuances. Um, that you know, this question comes up, and of course, you know, trying to to get paid accurately for what you do is is always a battle. So so. If we stick just to the bladder biopsy code, there's a couple of things that you need to consider. First of all is the description put, put forth by CPT. So you'll read the description. It says cystourethroscopy with biopsy, and then it has a parenthetical S right behind it. Um, so you can see that CPT was thinking when they put this in that one or more biopsies would all fit into this one code. Um, for one time. Um, you know, I, I don't know anybody who does multiple biopsies on one site. And so we're, we are talking about biopsies across the board um, that are at issue. And then, um, so the second thing um, that we want to consider in all this, so, so first of all, it's the intent. The CPT code really does say one biopsy code regardless of the number of biopsies. Um, CMS went a little bit further and they put in the medically unlikely edits policy. Um, so we want to look at, well, did CMS interpret CPT a little bit differently? Um, so if we look at the MUE for a 52204, you'll see that the practitioner services says one, um, which means that Medicare would consider this, uh, 
unlikely to be done more than one time. Um, and that would mean typically that they would reject any claim that had multiple uh, biopsy codes or multiple units um, on the same date. Then the second thing you want to look at, and we, and we may recall we did a program um, in, I think it was February um, or, or March, um, to uh, talk about what the adjudication indicator was. Um, and that adjudication indicator um, tells you what Medicare's flexibility is relative to that MUE, because remember, it's a medically unlikely edit, not an, a medically impossible edit, if you will. So the adjudication indicator here is two. Um, and and the, the adjudication indicator of two is a data service policy edit, which basically means that Medicare will not consider, even with medical record review, um, tr allowing that service to re be reported with more than one unit on a date of service. Um, so Medicare, in its interpretation of the CPT code by policy, and, and actually when you look at this across all payers as we've seen it, would say the hard answer here is no. It doesn't matter how many biopsies you, you do or how many locations within the bladder you do. You're only allowed to bill the biopsy code once per date of service, regardless of the number of biopsies. So that may have been way too detailed an answer, but it is a very hard no, unfortunately. I think. All right. So, so a follow up uh, question on that, Mark. Does that mean that there is no modifier that I can use to get that uh, bill at more than once? And you know the answer to that is <laughs> no. <laughs> There's not one. No bill, no modifier. Nope. So I think the uh, what the answer may be in the CPT descript description uh, wording. Sister sister urethroscopy for five two two zero four. Sister urethroscopy with biopsy or biopsies. And also, I will point out that in the Medicare's NCCI policy manual on page five, it specifically mentions the uh, C. I will say the. the Oh, gosh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Cystourethroscopy with biopsies, CPT code 52204, includes all biopsies during the procedure and shall be reported with one unit of service. Yeah, they definitely, in every way, they said no. It's one. That's it. And that it really does stem from the interpretation and, and the intent of the CPT code. That biopsy, parenthetical biopsies, the intention was bill it once for that date. And, and you know, the we could look at the clinical vignette as to, you know, what the average number of biopsies are, are that are done in a particular case. Um, so it's just, and, and I guess the one, the one thing we probably should add um, in all of this and something you shouldn't do is you do have that modifier 22. For the over, you know, for that unusual case, um, and it really does have to be unusual. So, you know, if you did twenty-five biopsies on a bladder for whatever reason that was out there, you know, you might try a modifier twenty-two to get a little extra reimbursement for that. But even that's going to be a stretch given the the diagnoses there or the description. So it really does need to be an exceptional and very unusual effort and an op note that really explains why you had to do so many biopsies, why it took so long, all the other things that are there as the only other option there. But uh, I would say, you know, as you look at those one to five biopsies, one to, one to seven biopsies, you know, it, that average is going to be you know, somewhere in that realm that it's really going to have to be an exceptional number of biopsies to, to talk about the 22 modifier. Awesome. Very good. All right. Uh, anything else uh, to add to the biopsy, uh, multiple biopsy? I think we had covered that pretty well. So any other final comments on that issue? Okay. All right. Well, let's do uh, 
couple of couple of housekeeping items. Want to first say please, uh, if you haven't already, join Dr. Lynn's group on Facebook, uh, the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. So uh, we encourage you to go over there. There's a lot of great discussions and a lot of great content on that Facebook group page. So, uh, uh, John, you want to just uh, tell a little bit more about what's on there that they can, you know, if somebody hasn't joined, why they should? Well, first of all, a compelling reason is that it's free. And you know what they say, if it's free, I'll take three, right? <laughs> so it's free. You, uh, Facebook being such a large and, and uh, ubiquitous platform, it's really easy for anyone to engage. And we only have folks who work in urology practices in the United States join. So the conversation is going to be very relevant. Everyone deals with pretty much the same problems, type of biopsy device that you use, coding and billing issues, office efficiencies, how many patients you see, how many FTEs do you need for to support a provider? Uh, how, uh, how do you room patients or how do you account for productivity? Um, so things that we deal on a day-to-day -day that is always on top of mind, but it's sometimes if you're working by yourself and you don't have a lot of outside connections, then this is a great sounding board for people to ask questions for you to contribute ideas. If you found, for instance, somebody asks, well, what are, you, what are some of the ways that you guys are, are cutting costs or being more efficient with your consumables? Somebody just asked that, I think, yesterday. So a lot of ideas are being shared and you know, once again, it's free. <laughs> so feel, feel free to join. Yes, we, we do encourage that. And, uh, you know, uh, the other thing that we have that uh, really encourages participation and you learn a lot from not only the presentation, but the discussion and the comments from other urology practices uh, is our Urology Advanced Coding and Reimbursement Seminar. We have two seminars one in December in Las Vegas, and one in January in New Orleans. And for those of you that have never attended, we do encourage you to come join us. It's a great uh, place to learn, great place to have, have those discussions and, and meet the others that are experiencing the same thing that you are. So it's, it's quite an experience, and we have a lot of great feedback, and we do encourage you to go to uh, the prsnetwork.com site and you can go to uh, prsnetwork.com forward slash 058 for this episode and in the notes I will also include uh, some of the things that we've discussed uh, including uh, the article a link to the article uh, from the AUA and uh, also a uh, link to uh, chapter 7 of the in the cms.gov site that explains a little bit more of uh of the, the topics that we discuss. So we have that and also we'll put some links to sign up for the uh, Facebook group or, or how to get there and then uh, the, the seminar. Right. When I was uh, when I was a paying attendee to the Urology Advanced Coding and Reimbursement Seminar, it's always, you always hesitate about uh, paying the entrance fee and, and attending. And what impressed me was about, was the guarantee uh, rate that you, that you all give. Uh, Ray, would you mind talking about that a little bit? We always guarantee that there will be something new for everyone. Even if you're an expert coder, you will take something home. And if you just take one new thing home on charging for something you haven't charged for or charging correctly for it, you've more than paid for the seminar. And We've always sort of joked and said, uh, well, let me go back. Earlier in the days, while somebody asked me how I could go around the country talking about the same topic year after year, and I told him it was easy. I didn't even have to change the questions because they kept changing the answers. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and I'm going to add in here um, – as we're going through all this stuff that um, the participation and the questions and the way people think about billing and coding is not the same. And, you know, the, the, the answer, and, you know, of course, everybody tries to slap everything into a very uh, binary answer. Yes, no, well, you know, it's got to go that way. And you, I think you've heard through our discussions that, 
you know, there is still some art to the practice of medicine, and there is an art to getting paid for that practice of medicine. So um, we really appreciate um, the interaction in those seminars, but we also appreciate the interaction um, that everyone has both on the, the thriving urology practice and in our, uh, in our coding forum um, on the PRS network site. And, and so th they both have great interactions. It's, it's worth a couple a few minutes a day to, to jump in and look and see what everybody else is, is asking and what questions they are. A lot of them may be questions you have, but some of them are be questions that maybe you didn't think of, but should have. Um, and so keep those questions coming, keep participating. And it's also interesting to watch some of the answers other people come up with because, you know, it's, it takes a community and it is a community of urology out there that's very active and supportive of, of what you do and, and how you practice. So true. All right. I think uh, we've covered everything today. John, final thoughts. The only thing that I would uh, like to say is that uh, we often don't know what we don't know. And the use of a community using the, the hive of like-minded individuals working in the same field is very important. And the other adage I'll give you is that um, uh, leaders are readers. So consider reading and don't be stuck in your own status quo bias, meaning don't be stuck in doing things that you've always done the same way. So be, uh, have an open mind and, and be looking, always be looking out for that uh, additional information to expand your knowledge. Good, great advice. Ray, final thoughts? Well, it, it's, it's a tough subject. And behind all of these interpretations that you hear that we talk about here, there may be hours of discussion behind the scene trying to figure out exactly what the correct answer should be. So all I can say is, particularly at the seminars and as well as in the podcast, we do try to give you the latest, the greatest, and up-to-date, accurate information. And you, Mark. I think you guys have said it all very well. Um, it's, you know, you got to keep researching, keep watching things, watch for the changes. They do change. Um, and um, keeping an eye on all that stuff is, is hard to look at for everyone. But, you, you, you know, use, use every resource you've got and um, decide which resources give you the best information and the go-tos. And, and um, you know, when you get to a point where you're stuck, then reach out to those that, that can give you the best information across the board because there's, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And just because you get the answer you like doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> or I like to say just because you're paid, it doesn't mean that is correct. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. With that, final word to you, John. All right. Well, remember that it's a game. Know the rules. Play it well so you don't leave any money on the table. And happy coding. Thank you for listening to the Urology Coding and Reimbursement Podcast, where we help urologists and their staff maximize income and efficiencies so there's time and energy for patient care and a happy life. Special thanks to Carl Painter for the music today. You can find his music on Spotify under his record label, The Juicery.